seated. If you would, mark in your song books number 454. 454 will be your song of invitation. You ever run your own business? <laughs> somebody, yeah, somebody has. I can hear that. <laughs> you know, it's not an easy task. It is not an easy task. I was thinking about, you know, what it takes to run your own business. First of all, you've got to have something to sell. You, you've got to have a product. You've got to have a service, whatever it may be. And, and it needs to be something, usually if you're starting your own business, it's something you're passionate about, is it not? You, you, you want to be passionate about whatever. Let me tell you something, if you're not passionate about it, don't go into business for yourself. Just don't do that. It's not going to make it. But what do you want to do with that product, that service? You want to show it to somebody. You want to show them what you've got. You want to let them know what it is that you have found and why it is so good. And then once you've found that product, once you, you, know, you get that desire that you want to share that with people, you, you start building a business on that, don't you? And as that business grows, you find out at some point in time, I can't do this all by myself. And you start having to hire people to help you because you understand that. Another problem that you might come in contact with in running your own business, it's good you got a good product and you want it to show it to people. It's, it's good, you know, that you, you build it to a point, you know, where you've got to have help. But you know what? If people don't know how to get it, it's not going to do you much good. It's not going to do you much good. I know in today's time we've got, you know, websites and all of these things that you can do to help build a business and all these things. But I remember when that wasn't the case. And I remember, now, I, listen, mom and dad started the greenhouse. I didn't have to go through all that mess, okay? I kind of inherited it as, as we went along. But I can remember working for the PTO for four years. I was president. Yeah. That's like running your own business. It is what it is. And you're trying, to get, you're trying to get the word out, you know, for events that you're holding and fundraising and all that. Listen, it ain't easy. It ain't easy to do all that. What's that got to do with anything we're talking about tonight? Well, I don't really know, but we're going to see if it fits in. Yes, there is some correlation. It may not be very tight correlation, but for some reason I thought of that as I was studying about the disciple that we're going to be looking at tonight. And it is not necessarily that the disciple is doing these things, but each one of those things that we talked about kind of fits in with what Philip would do. We're going to talk about Philip. Over in Matthew chapter 10, we have the, the list of disciples there, beginning in verse 2. Named, the names of the twelve apostles are these. First Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother. James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew the tax collector. James the son of Alphaeus and Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus. Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And so we have this list of, of disciples that we're looking at, that we're studying, kind of going through. I'm not necessarily going in order, y'all know that, but, uh, but, but just kind of looking at some of them. And you know what? Some of them we're not going to look at. Because as far as Scripture is concerned, I just read everything that's been written about some of them. We don't hear a whole lot about them. Philip is one of those that we don't hear a whole lot about, but we do get a little bit from him. Now, before we get into this, understand who we're talking about. Because you know over in Acts chapter uh, 6, we have those men chosen, you know, to serve tables. You know, those people, Philip is mentioned in amongst those. And it is that Philip that goes and preaches the gospel in Samaria. And it's that Philip that teaches the Ethiopian eunuch. Well, guess what? That's not the Philip we're talking about tonight. 
That is not Philip the Apostle. And so there's very little that is written about Philip. And as a matter of fact, all that we have written about Philip is in John. So if you'll turn to John chapter 1, that's where we'll be beginning tonight. And what we're going to, and I have dubbed him the revealing disciple. The revealing disciple. Now I say I have dubbed him that way because, I mean, it just fits with my lesson, okay? That, that really is the extent of, of why he's the revealing disciple. But I think you'll see as we go along why I say that. So the first point tonight is here, it, we, we'll see it here in John chapter 1, and we're going to begin in verse 43. John wrote, The following day Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said, Come and see. What do we see here in Philip? What we see in Philip is a desire to reveal Jesus to his friend. Now, I call him a friend. I don't know what else he would be, you know, for Philip to be going directly to Nathaniel to say, hey, I found the Messiah. I'm assuming that, okay? Whatever relationship they have, Philip has felt the need. Because, why did he feel the need? Because Jesus called him to follow Do you see that? Jesus called Philip to follow, and because of that, he thought of his friend, and he thought, I need to go tell my friend we have found him. We found him. Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, you talk about, you know, I mean, them's people up there, you know? That's, that's, it's that kind of tone, you know? Philip says, come and see. He wants to reveal to him the Messiah that he has found. And I feel like in our life as a disciple of Christ, in our life as a Christian, that is really what we ought to have. We ought to have a desire to reveal to others, to our friends, to our families, and to those that we come in contact, we want to reveal to them Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah the King, the Christ. Why do we want to do that? Because of what He has done for us. In Romans chapter 8, verses 12 12 through 14, Paul talks about being a debtor. He says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. What is he talking about there? He is feeling indebted to Christ, to the Spirit of Christ, for what it has brought to him, for what he has brought to him. The ability to live a Christian life. I want you to think about what that means. Jesus Christ came into this world to do what? To seek and to save the lost. To save people from their sins. And whenever we are saved from our sins by Jesus Christ, by doing the things He tells us to do, should we not feel a zeal for Him because of the thankfulness that we have in our heart? We ought to feel indebted to Him. Indebted to do what? Live by the Spirit. And that's what Paul's talking about here. We ought to feel indebted to live by the Spirit. I want you to think about this in terms of business. If you think about someone who is really down on their luck and they they really don't they, they don't have any schooling per se to help them get a job or, or anything like that. But here you have a business owner that, that comes along and says, Hey, I, you know what? I know that you have certain skills and, and we can build on those skills. Why don't you come work for me? 
and I'm going to pay you such and such amount. I want you to think about that employee and how he would feel trying to feed his family and this man has come and offered you a job, offered you the ability to earn money to feed your family. How would that person act in that business, in that company? If he feels the gratitude that he ought to feel, then he is going to do everything that he can to do exactly what his employer says so that he can build upon the skills and be an asset to that company. At least that's what we as business owners hope that they'll do. Is it not the same in Christianity? Jesus Christ has given us something that we cannot attain for ourselves, and that is salvation. And we ought to be so thankful to Him that we will do whatever He asks us to do in His kingdom. And the first and foremost thing that we ought to do is learn to live by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. Help people to see Jesus Christ through the life that we live. If we go over to Romans chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, he again talks about being a debtor. Paul says, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and unwise, so as much as it's in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Paul felt indebted to preach the gospel to the Gentiles because of the great gift that Jesus Christ had given to him. And we ought to be feel indebted as well. Think about that idea. You've got that product. You've got that product that you think is the greatest thing that since sliced bread. Let me tell you what I did this weekend. I went over to my wood shop and I made me a bread slicer. I did. I've been wanting one of them for a while and I thought, I ain't paying that kind of money. I'm going to make it myself. The greatest thing, can you imagine if there was not a bread slicer and then all of a sudden you come up with this bread slicer and how people, that's cool. That is neat. How do you get such even slices of bread? If you go research history and you research the time whenever that came out, that was huge. The greatest product since sliced bread. That's where that phrase came from. But if you've got that product, what do you want to do with it? You want to show it off. You want to tell people about it. If you have the greatest gift in the world given to you, what should you want to do? You should want to show off the gift giver, Jesus Christ. You should want to tell people about the gospel. It is in that gospel that where we learn about Jesus and the gift that He has given to us, and we learn about the lifestyle that He wants to live in us. And, and it's in that gospel that we learn that we give up ourselves to live our life for Him. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, what does He say? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I should be willing to do whatever it takes to show Jesus Christ in my life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, Paul says, Imitate me as I also imitate Christ. And that's what we ought to be showing the world. We ought to be showing the world Christ to the point that people can imitate us in the same manner that we imitate Christ. Those who receive gifts ought to be willing, or ought to feel indebted to also share that gift. So seek out those. Seek out those whom you can reveal the Savior to. The second point that I want to make about Philip this evening is in John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And actually, these last two points coincide with what we talked about with Andrew. But we're going to look at it from a little bit different aspect because we're talking about Philip instead of Andrew. But here, beginning in verse 5, we're talking about the feeding of the 5,000. 
But in verse 5 it says, Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many? I read verse 9 just because, you know, we've already read that with Andrew. But I want you to think about, okay, we're talking about the revealing disciple. How is this, how is Philip revealing anything here? I want you to think about why Jesus asked him. Why did Jesus ask Philip? Philip, about feeding these people. If we look at the record, what we see is that the feeding of the 5,000 takes place in Bethsaida. That is the region where Philip was from. There were other disciples from that region. And so there may be other reasons that were involved in Jesus asking Philip specifically, but one of those must be because he's from the area. And he would know what was available in the area. And so that might be one of the reasons. But I want you to notice uh, his response to the question. He says, you know, 200 denarii worth of bread are not sufficient that everyone may have a little. What is he saying? Is he saying that there's not enough money to buy the bread? Is he saying that there's not enough... um, opportunity to buy the, you know, there's not enough places to buy the bread. Is that what he's talking about? i tell you what I see here, and I, and I, had, I struggled with this point. But what I see is Philip revealing the problem. He's revealing the problem. They had 5,000 plus people to feed. And Lord, to, I mean 200 denarii worth of bread is not enough to feed these people. He is seeing the magnitude of the problem, and we see him revealing that. Okay, there's probably different lessons you could get out of that, but that's the one I'm going to stick with, okay? But I want you to think about that in the aspect of our lives. Think about the magnitude of the problem. What were the disciples instructed to do? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I don't know about you, but the world's big. And there's a lot of people in the world. And for some reason, it keeps seeming to get more and more every day. That's a big task. That's a big problem. And so what we see is in this revelation, if you will, I mean, we know it's a big problem. But what do we do with that? How do we solve this problem? Well, if we go into Jesus' thought process, who's going to solve the problem? Jesus is going to solve it. Jesus is going to solve it. In Luke chapter 10, whenever Jesus is gathering his disciples, and at this point in time, he's sending out 70. 70 of his disciples in twos, pairs of two, to go out and, and preach into the, in the different areas. But I want you to notice what he says in verse 2 there. He says to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. What does Jesus say to do? Pray for help. He says, pray for help. We need help. Now, in, in the realm of the disciples, and you think back what they did, you go back to, to Acts, and you begin reading through the, the history of the early church, and what do you find is you find they're preaching there in Jerusalem, and they are converting people constantly. Day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls. All right, what are those people doing? Well, because of the gratefulness of those people, because they have found the Savior and they found the truth, they are eager to do what? They're eager to preach the gospel. 
And so there you have more help. You have more laborers. And I, and I think as you go through there, you see that again. You know, whenever, uh, whenever uh, Stephen was stoned, you know, and it talks about there in chapter 8 how they were scattered. They were scattered, and as they went, they preached the gospel. They preached the gospel. How was this huge task of preaching the gospel of the whole world going to get done? Through laborers. Through those who were willing to share what Jesus had given to them. I want you to look with me in John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Beginning in verse 35. Jesus says, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for, the, for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that of which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. Now, I don't want to get deep into what Jesus is talking about there, you know, the ones that sowed, you know, before they came along and all that. Here's, here's what I want you to notice. There is sowing and there is reaping that needs to be done. There is sowing and there is reaping that needs to be done. This past week, my brother, he told me earlier in the day, we're going to plant potatoes. We're going to get it. Yes, we're a little behinder than y'all are, okay? We're up on the mountain, so it's colder. But, you know, we're going to plant potatoes. And I said, okay, holler at me. I'll see if I can come out and help you. Well, at the time he called, we were just sitting down for supper. And I said, whenever we get through with supper, if you're still out there, we'll come out and help. When we got through with supper, they were done. It didn't take them a long. Well, if y'all don't know this, he's got a thousand children. So, you know, they, they, they just went out there and did it, you know. Okay, that might be a little like, exaggeration. But, but they, they got it done. Guess what? Whenever the fall time comes, we'll be expected to get out there and dig potatoes. And it won't be a one-day thing, and there'll be plenty of opportunity to get it done. There, there are sowers, and there are going to be reapers. Sometimes we need to do both. We need to be out here sowing the seed of the gospel. Because the problem is not going to be tackled by us coming here and sitting in these pews. We've got to get out here and spread the seed. And we've got to be watching for those who are ripe and ready for harvest. I can remember a preacher telling me about a young man that he sat and studied with. I'm not old enough to have these stories yet, okay? I mean, yeah, I've sat and studied with young people, but, you know, maybe a little bit later. But he talked about how that kid he, he studied with and told him that, you know, taught him the gospel, all these things. And he never did obey the gospel. And because of having to move away, doing something else, he lost track of that young man. About 20, 30 years go by, and he's coming back through the area because they've asked him to come preach gospel meeting or whatever. And he's preaching the gospel meeting, and this gentleman comes up to him with his wife and his three kids. And says, I was that young man that you studied with, that you planted the seed. And let me tell you something. Planting the seed was good, but that wasn't it. There were a whole lot of people in that congregation that watered and cultivated and worked with that young man and baptized that young man. All different people at different times, for different reasons, coming and helping that young man come to the gospel. Do you see the problem? 
It is huge. But if each one of us does something to help with it, we can get it done. And you know what? You might not, not ever see the results of your efforts. You might, not, you might not be like that preacher who comes along and, and comes across that man again. But plant the seed. When you see those who are ready, be sure and be ready for the harvest. The point is that laborers are needed. Many hands make light work. I've heard that all my life. And let me tell you something, as a brother of three, I know how valuable it is to have a little bit of help. I know how that, because sometimes I didn't get it. You know, that's the reason why I know the value. No, I'm just kidding. Don't tell my brothers I said that. We've got to get to work. We've got to get to work spreading the gospel. So let's all pitch in on that. All right, last point, John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Beginning in verse 20. What we're going to see is a disciple, Philip, revealing the way. Revealing the way. Now, whenever I say that point, you might think in your mind, why are we not going to John chapter 14 if he's really revealing the way? Well, we'll get over it in a minute. But let's look at John chapter 12. Beginning in verse 20, it says, Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. All right, what are we talking about here? I want you to think about why did they come to Philip? We're talking about Greeks. These are not Jews who are wanting to see Jesus. These are Greeks. These are Gentiles. Why are they coming to Philip? It's interesting that John records here the fact that Philip is from Bethsaida of Galilee. Now, if you remember from our lesson this morning, I, I had you visualize in the map, you know, the Dead Sea, and then you go up the Jordan River and you got the Sea of Galilee. All right, well, it's that region around the Sea of Galilee is where Bethsaida is, over on the eastern, northeastern side, around in that area. Well, that is close to the borders of the nation of Israel, that, the land of Judea, you know, where the Jews live. Now, there's other people living in the area at this time, but the idea that that is on the border is significant, I think. Now, this is my opinion, but it would seem natural for Greeks who lived kind of beyond that area that maybe they are recognizing Philip as someone from that region. Is that why John's pointing this out? I don't know. I don't know. But there is something significant about the fact that he's from Bethsaida, or John wouldn't point that out. Okay? And so, whatever the reason is, these men are coming to Philip to, to see, hey, can we go see Jesus? And so what does Philip do? Philip shows them the way. Now, if you read the rest of the, the story there, you'll see that Jesus does not receive them at that time, and that's, that's a different story and all that. But looking at Philip and looking at what he's doing, he has a desire to show them or reveal the way to get to Jesus. And it should be our desire to show people the way to Jesus. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so if anyone is going to come to the Father, if anyone is going to receive life, the life that Jesus is able to give, then we've got to show the way to Jesus. And then Jesus then, in turn, gives us the way to receive those things. In John chapter 17, when Jesus is praying, this, this, is, Jesus, this is the Lord's Prayer. That's what I, I dub this the Lord's Prayer. Not that one over yonder in, in Matthew chapter 6. That's, that's a model prayer. This is the Lord's Prayer. 
And he says, it says, beginning in verse 1, says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this eternal life, or this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And so what we find here in those verses, Jesus is saying he has the authority to grant eternal life. He's the one that has it. And he's also showing us the way to receive it. How do we receive it? By believing in God the Father by believing in Jesus Christ the Son. Of course, we could talk about the things that are involved in believing, the obedience that goes along with that, but my point here this evening is Philip showed the way, and that's what we need to do. We need to show the way to the one who can grant eternal life, to the one who can grant access to God the Father. A disciple of Jesus will want to show people the way to Him. So show the way. Show the way to Jesus by being a disciple, a follower of Him. There's a friend of mine who preaches down in um, Mission Ridge, Georgia. Known him for a long time. And he just recently started a... um, it's like a podcast, it's like a video thing, something, a vlog or whatever you want to call it. But the focus of it is being a disciple of Jesus. And I want you to consider how important that is. We need to learn to be disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what Jesus told his apostles to do in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. He said, go and make disciples of all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you all the way, even to the end of the age. We need to be disciples of Christ. And we need to point the way to Christ so that others can also be disciples of Jesus Christ. We are indebted as Christians to show others to Jesus. Do you not understand the magnificent gift that Jesus Christ has given you by giving His life and His blood on the cross to cover your sins. There was nothing that we could do in and of ourselves to take away our sin. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God Himself came down, lived the perfect life completely and totally innocent of any wrong and gave His life so that we could have life. Should we not feel indebted to show people Jesus, to show them what it is to be Jesus in our lives. But the problem is great. The problem is great and numerous. I mean, people are all over the place. And you you know who I'm talking about. You know who I'm talking about better than I know who I'm talking about. Because you know the people that you know. And I know the people that I know. And you know what? Some of them people don't cross paths. And so it's going to take all of us to spread the gospel. It is a huge ordeal. Yes, absolutely. But we can do it if we all work at it. If we all put our hands to the work. We need to be showing people the way to Jesus. The way to his gospel. The way to eternal life and the heavenly father. We need to be... be be disciples of Him. Everyone needs to know the way, and it is up to us to show them. And so we need to get busy at the work. This evening, if you are not a child of God, why not? I mean, Jesus has given us the greatest gift that could ever be. 
The only thing that you have to do is give yourself to Him. You have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It, listen, if you don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, there's no point in going further because nothing else will do you any good. You've got to believe Jesus is the Christ. And then you've got to repent of your sins. What does that mean? It means that you need to change your mind about sin. I want you to think about how much God hated sin. And He did so much for us to help us understand what sin is and to show us how we can live sinless lives. Knowing that was not enough, He sent Jesus to die for the for our sins. We need to be showing people the way. To do that, you have to start that journey. You have to be obedient to the gospel. You have to change your mind about sin. You've got to confess Him as your Lord. And you've got to submit to His will, being buried with Him in baptism. That's what Scripture says. Now, if you don't understand that that's what Scripture says, come see us and let's study about it so that you understand what Scripture says, so that you can be faithful and be, and be obedient to Him. This evening, if you have done those things, but maybe there's something wrong in your life that you need prayers for or you need help with, if it's public, come and let us help you if we can. If it's private, take care of it. Whatever it might be, whatever we can help you with tonight, please come forward as we stand and as we sing. Amen.